Hi everybody, very welcome to yet another live stream here on the Mentor Pilot channel. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. First of all, I want to say thank you to Mikey over at Plane Savers and Captain Joe who did an absolutely amazing live stream right now. Um, these are the kind of collaborations that uh, is the positive thing of this uh, horrible, horrible situation that we find ourselves in. Because all of a sudden there are loads of pilots sitting on the ground with nothing to do. And of course, if we have a possibility to do a live stream and maybe answer some questions, well, that's what we will do. So if you didn't see it, I highly recommend you to go over to Plane Savers, have a look at the rerun of the live stream. It's really, really interesting. Um, and it's great to see, you know, our different approaches to things and how we do things and, you know, especially the, the different types of live streams. And, and of course, Plane Savers is a fantastic channel to watch. If you love old warbirds or DC-3s and you love a lot of snow and ice, then that's definitely the place that you should go. I, I you know, I, <laughs> I love the stuff that he is putting out. But anyway, we're back here now and... Um, um, what we will as always focus on is you guys what questions you have the if you are maybe a little bit worried right now if you have questions about what's going on maybe i don't have all of the answers guys i definitely don't but i will do my damnedest to try to uh to ease any um any pain you might have uh, answer any questions that you might have and uh yeah so without further ado let's uh, kick on with it um, now, if you haven't done this before, the way that I tend to do this is I try to take some questions from the normal chat. Now, the chat goes really, really quickly, okay? That right now, it's 500 people here um, watching. There tends to be a 1,000, a little bit more than that. So I won't be able to answer all of them. But if you have a question that you really, really want me to answer, then you can both get that and support the channel by using the super chat function. That's that little um, dollar sign there. You will be sending um, sending money to the channel, which will help me to create more content. Uh, and you'll also highlight the question to me so I can see it among all of these hundreds of questions. So those are the benefits. Um, but yeah, and I've seen people sending hot dogs and hamburgers and stuff I've just eaten, but I'm still happy with those. So let's see, I'll take some questions from the normal chat to start off with. Uh, can you two talk about G-Force and how uh, it affects aviation? Well, I mean, G-Force is... Um, it's, it's what happens when you change direction with when you have something with mass and you want to change the direction of it all right that the the, the way that that the gravity works and the way that that anything works if you follow news uh, sorry um, newton's second law of motion is that everything that has an action needs to have an opposite and equal reaction so that's what g-forces are basically when we fly an aircraft and we we start turning it, we're changing direction of the um, of the aircraft. Uh, our mass had an ori original direction, and obviously now you're changing direction and the mass wants to continue straight ahead. So as we are you know, pulling, if you see you're flying fighter jets, for example, and you're turning into a steep turn and you pull, that those G-forces are gonna start going up. Now, on a normal passenger flight, we we don't deal with much g forces at all you know we're talking 1.3 g's maybe you know 2 g's worst case scenario um but very very little the the you know passenger aircraft are not built to take any g forces really so their impact on aviation commercial aviation is, is very little um there is when you start to go into the theory of it that's more you know the more banking you're doing the the higher the uh, stall speed will be so you're gonna have to be careful with that but i'm not gonna go into because i'm not prepared to go into the theory behind uh, that um but it's not something like it's not something that on a normal day's operation that we would ever think about okay now I am seeing that this is right. I'm gonna to try to make sure that we don't lose signal here because uh, I see that the quality is coming down a little bit. Let's see if it goes better now. Guys, can you see me or uh, is is there a problem with the quality of the stream? Um, just tell me if you can see and hear me pro properly, okay? Cool. Okay, so it's working. Okay, because I'm getting messages saying that it's not that it doesn't have uh, as high quality as it should have. Okay, cool. So what I'll do is I'll start working off the, um, uh, the super chat questions here. So the first one was sent 
quite a long while ago actually and it says why does the 777 has a much lower flying altitude comparing to an airbus 350 or 787 or even an airbus 380 on long haul flights now i don't think that that is the case actually um you see it it was lagging for a bit okay um no the fact is that it's not. Uh, the, it might be the fact that you are um, that you are watching triple sevens flying out initially, um, and of course any long haul flight when it's loaded up with a lot of fuel, it will not be able to climb as high. And they're going to do what we call step climbs, which comes later on. So they're going to start off at maybe a flight of a three three zero three four zero, and then as they burn fuel and they get lighter, they're going to eventually climb up to the altitudes which are you know um, suitable. For them the higher we go generally the uh the more efficient it becomes uh, <clears throat> but the triple seven is not underpowered it has uh, two huge engines uh and it definitely can hold the same kind of cruising altitude so that should not be the case grand Rennie, thank you very much for the hot dog it's always appreciated with the hot dog um simone faguto how is your family doing and when are you flying again captain well i mean obviously that is a good question in these times um my family is doing great. Uh, I am doing great. We have been on in lockdown here in our house. We're not able to leave our house for the last five, coming up to six days now, um, which makes funny things to you. Um, normally, we're not we're not around each other as much as we are now. But fortunately, my two kids are great. They're getting a little bit restless now. I think the one that is struggling the most here is probably my wife because she loves having a little bit of own time and she's not getting much of that um, right now. So, but apart from that, we're doing great, right? Um, I am focusing on trying to come up with ways to to help in whatever way I can. Um, let's see, make sure that you still can hear me there because I'm still showing really low quality output here. But anyway, my job at the moment is it's trying to come up with ways where I can help people who are not as fortunate as I am. Now, I am on unpaid leave uh, for at least two months. We will see, depending on what happens to this uh, to this outbreak, how long it will be. Um, but I am I'm so fortunate to to have this YouTube channel, to have you guys, to actually keep my family afloat. So what I'm trying to do with my off time now is coming up with with content that will help you, you know, uh, finding information about what's going on in the training industry, what's happening to people who are at flight school, how are flight schools helping their students when this is happening, what should you be thinking about if you are in training right now uh, or about to go into training. This is what I will be focusing on for the next coming weeks. So what you're going to see is you're going to see some, um, let's see, Good image, good sound, good. Um, you're gonna see some specially branded videos coming out, right? I'm gonna do APC, as in the Airline Pilot Club branded videos with a different type of uh, color scheme, uh, different thumbnails. And whenever you see a thumbnail like that, you'll know that this is us, me, and the and the team in the Airline Pilot Club uh, working on trying to come up with good uh, accurate information for you guys so that's what we are going to try to do i'm going to try to read to use my extreme reach into um the pilot training community um to reach you guys and andy is going to try to use his reach uh within you know iasa um airlines um flight schools and so on to try to make sense of what's going on so you'll see more of that coming out of it um, and keeps me busy, which is good. And thank you very much for your support, by the way. Now, guys, if you really want to support, right, I've seen a huge influx of Patreons during the last few days, and I'm so grateful to you guys, because what I'm also trying to do is, is get more Patreons in so that I can focus less on um, kind of sponsored content, right, uh, and more on special content for you guys. And the more Patreons I have, um, the better, the more I can kind of say no to sponsored content and, and go on with with specialized content that maybe has a slightly smaller audience, but that can actually help more, all right? Because I know that the videos that I do that reaches a lot of people are the kind of where I explain of, you know, how does a wing work? Why does it look that way or, or something like that? But if I go into doing more technical stuff or if I talk more about, um, 
whatever it might be, like I said, flight training or how you should be acting in your way into flight school, it's going to have a smaller audience, um, which is what I want to do. Um, but then the more patrons I have, the more I can focus on that, especially on times like this. So, Jeremy, Jeremy Kana, uh, do pilots have to regularly show that they remember all of their lists of memory items? Is it easy to forget some over time? Yes, we do regularly have to show that we know our memory items. Um, we do that in our recurrent training, so our recurrent checking, which we do every six months. It's either an operator proficiency check as an OPC or a license proficiency check, which is an LPC. Okay. And um, that, you know, you're not going to have to show all of the memory items at once because there are quite a few. Now, they have become less and less, actually, I should be saying. But over a three year cycle, um, the OPC and our recurrent training cycle is uh, supposed to handle all different systems within an aircraft. So every three years, all of the systems are being rehearsed, which means that all of the memory items will have been checked during a three year cycle. And to answer your second part of the question, yeah you can forget them. If you're not diligent, if you don't go in and actively uh, look through your QRH, like let's see if I have one here. There we go. The, uh, the quick reference handbook. If you don't go in when you are on a long time off like I am right now and you, you look through it the, and repeat the checklist and read through them, uh, you will forget them. Um, and that's not good because obviously the memory items are there for a reason. They're there because you need to know them when the shit hits the fan. Um, so you need for your own well-being and for your proficiency to keep kind of repeating them. Keep them up to date. Make sure that you know them so that the one day that you go out and you have a runaway stabilizer, for example, you know exactly what to do. Um, or you have a car, not cargo fire, but an APU fire or a, an engine failure or an engine seizure or, you know, high engine vibrations or something like that. You need to know that there are memory items and what those memory items are because your colleagues are depending on you knowing them. Okay. So that's the dog Polly. Great to have you here, dog. I hope you're doing great. Um, hi, Petra. You've got great skill in teaching concept and practice. Do you learn how to do that as part of your pilot training role? Uh, is it a great transferable skill for your video? Sorry, it's a great transferable skill for your videos. Best wishes from dog. Uh, all right. So yes and no. Um, in order to become a type rating instructor or a synthetic flight instructor, an SFI, you need to go through something called a core course, okay, or a BISC course, which is basic instructional instructional skill course. Uh, so that is about a week long course where you do learn about how to present a subject in front of an audience, um, how to make sure that you make get the best out of your students, things like that, right? So they, it's basically a crash course into teaching. Now, that does not necessarily make you a great teacher because a weak course is only a weak course. No matter how, how much they can cram into that, you are only having a week. So there is a little bit of well, there's a lot of learning to be done while you're actually teaching as well. But after a while, you do get a feeling of what works. You also get a feeling of or how to interact with people, how people respond. So unfortunately, I can't see you, which is a you know something that is is a, makes it harder for me. Okay, if I could see you, I could see when your body language is starting to indicate that you don't really understand. Maybe you're starting to flicker your eyes around a little bit, something, and I can go in and I can kind of explain it in a slightly simpler way. But since I can't do that, basically I just have to try to imagine that I am sitting, sitting in front of a friend of mine who is not in the airline business, but it's pretty smart because you guys are. Um, and I will be trying to explain it like I would to a person that's not in the business. And that tends to be the best way of, of doing it. Okay, Even with cadets, actually, you can kind of not dumb it down, but you can make it simpler until you see that they get it. And then you can not kind of take it up a notch and you make sure that they still get it. And as soon as you start to see those blank eyes and those those kind of facial expressions and body language that indicates that they don't get it, then you can step back a bit. OK, so there is a lot that you learn with just doing a lot of instruction over and over and again. But then again, my mom is a teacher as well. Uh, I might have gotten some of her skills, um, but thank you. Thank you for thinking that uh, that I do a good job because it's um, it's it's always great to hear that from people. 
Uh, Jake Schröder, thank you very much for your support, Jake. Uh, your English is perfect. Why did you learn to speak so fluently? Um, okay, so Swedes in general have quite good English. Um, that tends to be because we start learning quite early, but I don't think that that's that at all. I think it has to do with the fact that the um, the the large majority of our TV shows are in original language. So when we're small, well, maybe the, like the kids shows are only in Swedish, but then as you get into, you know, when you're 10 or above, uh, you will start to listen to original language to the series that you're following, the movies that you're watching, all of that. So you get immersed in the language, which means that you, you hear how people are pronouncing things, you, you basically learn it. And that together with starting to learn English at, I think, the age of six or seven, uh, that combines into a basic good knowledge of the language. However, obviously, you don't get to complete native fluency. I haven't got native fluency, right? I'd still pronounce things the wrong way. I still have a bit of a uh, Swedish accent to it, and I think a little bit of an Irish accent as well. Um, but I have been working for an employer that uses only English language as you know, my everyday work for the last almost 20 years now. So if I couldn't speak good English, that would be that would be bad. And then, of course, what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm married to um, to a Spanish, to a Catalan girl. Um, and um, initially we spoke English to each other. Then she learned Swedish, believe it or not. And now I'm trying to learn Spanish, but to my great shame, I'm not as good. I doesn't. I don't learn as quick as uh, as I would like to. Even though Spanish is a is a great language and it's fairly simple language as well. It's. Uh, I'm just getting old, I guess. <laughs> but thank you. So uh, Joshua McCluskey, uh, how long after takeoff are the outer throttle and altitude uh, heading autopilot activated? Okay, so um, when we take off, we already have the outer throttle activated. So when we when we press the toga button on the takeoff roll, the outer throttle automatically sets takeoff thrust for us. We don't have to sit and manually kind of set it. We still say set takeoff thrust so that the uh, pilot monitoring verifies that they actually get takeoff thrust. It's a redundant system to make sure that we actually do get the thrust that we want. Sometimes the outer throttle might make a mistake or something happens. So the, there needs to be someone to check it, but it's the outer throttle who sets it. When it comes to the autopilot, it depends a little bit. Uh, normally we, uh, as, as you know, normal procedures in my airline, we engage the autopilot above a thousand feet above ground level. So a thousand feet above the ground, um, providing that there's no reason not to, then we will make sure that, if I'm the pilot flying, I'll make sure that the aircraft is properly trimmed. Uh, I will make sure that everything else is set the way I want it. Then I will go Command A and verify on my flight mode enunciator, my FMA, that I have all of the modes um, in the, that I need. Now, very careful here. There is a there is a tendency in the industry, especially among uh, young, inexperienced people, to just press the button and call Command A without checking the FMA. And I've seen, even on a check ride and in real life, where they have pressed the button, they've had a little bit of input on the yoke, and when you have that and you press the button, the autopilot does not engage. Right? And they haven't noticed that. Just release it. It's like. Oh, Come on, B, and then start looking around. The aircraft is not an autopilot, and you can see how it's starting to kind of. So you tell them, check, check your autopilot, and then they remember it. So it is if you are coming into this, um, into this position, if you have just gotten a job as a first officer or whatever, make sure that you always press, verify, and call. Press, verify, call. You never press and call. Right? There always has to be a verification of that. You get what you want from the aircraft. Because there's been so many, I mean, this it's so easy to sit back and relax and just click buttons and not really care. But the problem is that quite often shit happens. <laughs> you know, you have to. You really, really have to verify that you're getting what you want from the aircraft at every given point. So that's important. So a thousand feet AGL, we put it in, then we keep it on for the rest of the flight. And I got a good question actually um, a few days ago. I can't remember. I think it was on the Mentor Aviation app. Um, there was someone who asked me, what was the question exactly? Yeah, if we were able to and trained to fly the aircraft manually from A to B, and if that was the case, why don't we? Right? Sounds like a reasonable uh, question. Now, the answer to that is that 
we can fly the aircraft manually, but we have to maintain below RVSM airspace. So if we don't have a working autopilot, we cannot fly higher than 28,000 feet in Europe because uh, you need a working autopilot in order to fly in reduced vertical separation minima airspace. So we would never fly it above that altitude without having the autopilot engaged. The reason we would not do it are many. Okay, There's a reason that an autopilot was uh, created in the first case, and that is to take away workload from the pilot. Because if you don't have an autopilot, you and a lot of your senses and skills and attention is going to go to just inputting, you know, making sure that you're maintaining the altitude and the heading and the track and, and you know, adding a little bit of trust and keeping all of that. So all of that attention that you're using is going to be kind of narrowed into that, which means that all of the things that's going on around you, which might be failures happening or something happening in the cabin or other traffic around you or air traffic control, something happening, you won't have that. Okay, you won't have the capacity to take that in. And the same goes for the pilot monitoring, who might not be actually flying the aircraft, but now have to really monitor that the aircraft is flown okay, because you never know when you know the pilot flying relaxes. So the attention of both pilots gets much, much smaller, which decreases safety levels. Okay, so that's why we have automation in the first place. It's not because we can't fly the aircraft, we can, but it's not the safest way to do that. All right, the safest way is to tell our third crew member, which is the auto um, automation, the autopilot and the auto throttle, to fly the aircraft, to input the rods, which can do perfectly, and then we can monitor it. And depending on if it does a good job or not, we can then maybe disconnect if we need to, or we can tell it to do different things. But this is the whole thinking behind um, using automation. Now, the other side of that is using automation so much that you forget how to fly the aircraft, and there's a fine line to walk between those two uh, we do a lot of manual training in the simulator, so every six months at least you'll be flying raw data approaches that, you know, approaches flown without any flight director in like howling crosswinds and you do wind shear escape maneuvers and stalls and steep turns and stuff like that in order to keep your scan speed up and your manual flying skills. And then in good weather conditions we can disconnect quite early and fly the aircraft in manually into our destination as well. But we never turn off any flight directors or degrade the aircraft in any way in order to practice because, you know, we have you guys on board. You're sitting behind us. Our main priority is to make sure that you guys are safe all the time. So so that's why, you know, that's that's why we don't hand fly it all the time. And uh, when it comes to approach, like I was saying, you can disconnect if you are in good weather and a place that you know um, and there's not a lot of VFR traffic or other traffic around you, then you can decide to disconnect early. Otherwise, we tend to keep the autopilot in until we are on the glide slope and then somewhere a couple of hundred feet above the minima if the weather is good, we'll disconnect, start hand flying it. If there's a lot of wind, I tend to hand fly it a little bit further out because you need to get a feel for the aircraft before you get into the flare. But otherwise, maybe 500 feet or so descending, you disconnect everything, then you go down and you land it manually. And the question was also, if an aircraft has the capability to land manually, sorry, to land automatically, why don't you use it? And I've actually done videos about that. And there are some quite big downsides to using outer land all the time. So you can actually check that out. But some main ones being um, that, at least in the 77, it doesn't have rudder authority. So it doesn't do a very good job at crosswind landings. Uh, it uses more runway because it starts to flare at 50 feet rather than at around 30 feet, which we do. Um, so there's more runway needed. There is safeguarding of the ILS signals needed. There's loads of stuff like that. Okay, uh, Brian Blazer. Um, is asking, can you please detail the difference between with cat, cat two and a cat, sorry, a cat three and a cat three Bravo approach, and what difference between needed avionics there might be, if any? Um, I'm going to be 100% um, honest here and say that I don't have the exact differences in front of me. Now, generally, the difference between different category of trees is the visibility that you can take. For example, on the cat three. Alpha that we intend to fly, you um, you need to have 200 meters of visibility, even if you you know even if it's an outland. I think as you go higher up to Bravo and Charlie, you actually get even lower, so 100 meters visibility. And I think uh, I think at Charlie there's actually zero zero meters visibility. Um, avionics. This is, has to do with, for example, the rollout capability. So if the aircraft and the autopilot has the possibility to keep the center line by itself after landing, the 737 does not. Uh, because the rudder is not involved in it. 
Um, um, so I'm not 100% sure on exactly the details, but these are some of the details. Um, I think that the, the avionics needed down to landing are the same, but I think it's what the aircraft can actually do after landing that is different. Uh, and then, of course, it's up to the airport as well. So the airport needs to be have the facilities to do it. Um, so, do, do, do. Grant, Rennie, thank you very much for the peach. Um, I was due for some dessert. I just, just finished dinner here. So, William Henwood. Uh, hi, Peter. Will there be any potential negative impact with cargo flights? Also, may I ask about APC? I assume there could be delays with this. Thank you. Um, okay, so, um, negative impact on cargo flights, there will be. There's no question about that. There are um, impacts on, for example, the um, you know the airspace. Um, there is impact on where you can come in and land, but mostly it's going to have impact because the industry is impacted. So if the industry is is in a dire straits, if there's a, a general downturn on the industry, it means that there will be less need for cargo flights, which means that there will be impact. However, not nearly as restrictive as it is on the passenger side, because what we have to deal with is, of course, the spread of the virus that has nothing to do with cargo. The fear of the spread of the virus and the fear of, of, of moving around, that has no impact on the cargo either. So the cargo flights are less impacted than the passenger flights are. Uh, when it comes to the Airline Pilot Club, we you, I will put a video out very soon together with my co-founder, Mr. Andy O'Shea, uh, where we will discuss a little bit about what we see going forward. We are still working on everything that we promised that we would be working with. But of course, when you end up in a major, major downturn like what we're seeing now, something that no one could predict and no one had even thought about, but just a month ago or two months ago, um, there will be some implications. We don't know exactly what those implications are, but rest assured that the Airline Pilot Club, our, our kind of quest to find the best people, to train the best people in the best schools, to try to fund the best people and to find jobs for them, those things are still true. And even though there might be a delay to when we can implement all of these things, we are still working full speed ahead to, um, to get this done, all right? We know that after, um, after a blip like this hopefully is, there will be an upturn again. We don't know exactly how the industry will look. There might be other players there, but the players still have to play somewhere and the playing field is still there, okay? It has been after 9-11, after SARS, it's been after the 2008 calamity. Um, it will be now, all right? But it will look different. And until we know exactly how the playing field looks, we, we don't know exactly what players we should be playing with. If you understand what I mean. So if you're interested in this, if you like, I'm hoping that you guys are, then make sure that you go in and you sign yourself up for the newsletter. We will be sending out new more newsletter. But like I said in the beginning of the stream, I will also do a lot more APC branded videos where me and Andy and maybe some other players in the airline industry are going to be there for you guys. This is going to be a beyond the paywall, all right? So initially, obviously, um, membership of the Airline Pilot Club is was going to be paid because the stuff that we were going to do required it. But at the current climate, we are just going to try to help. So we are restructuring the website. It has not opened yet, but it will be open in a few days into a, um, into a tool for you guys and for the airline industry and for the schools to use. So you will see that coming. And the, the the point here is that we want to try to help. I'm going to try to reach out to some of my YouTube friends as well um, to help out with this. But we're going to do what we can. Right, so Julian Francois, Francois Colin, uh, thank you for your support. Which airline do you use to work for? You mentioned your base was reduced to 10 month operation. Um, yeah, and once again, and as I always say, I don't talk about my airline on social media. They have asked me not to, and I'm not a spokesperson for my airline. So um, even though everyone kind of can very quickly find out who I'm working for, I'm still working for, I still don't talk about them because it's not my place to do that. All right, and I hope that you guys um, can accept that. Cody, Popam, thank you. How long can your airline survive current circumstances? How is Union reacting? How is the Union reacting? Subscribe to Patreon. Good. Subscribe to Patreon. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Good job on creating income outside of pallet salary. Yeah. Um, now, I knew that I was going to be on two months of furlough 
um, that was planned because of my base going from a yearly base to a, a seasonal base. So I had already planned for that. And it just happened to happen right now when all of this calamity is going on. So, um, so I had kind of planned for it. But yes, having this YouTube channel and having the Mentor Aviation app and having the Facebook page and uh, eventually now the Airline Pilot Club keeps me going. Okay, and it has so much to do with aviation and the harder things become, the more complicated things become, the bigger my role is here to help. Okay, the more responsibility I feel for for the people who are going into the industry or maybe you are in the middle of your training and you don't know where to turn to or you've just finished your training and now you're looking for that first airline job and all of this, which looks like Armageddon is happening outside, who are you going to turn to? And I want, I really, really want to try to help here because I can, I can almost feel the pain, right? I, I, I understand it. I remember I got my first airline job about eight months after 9-11. The airline industry was dead then. It was it was going through a, a crisis like now, where airlines had grounded their fleets, where pe- airlines were going bankrupt, and there was no jobs. But I was lucky enough to manage to get the one job there was, and I am so grateful for that. And I would love to be able to, in one way or another, help people who are in the similar situation as I were back in 2002. Okay, uh, how long my airline would survive? Very hard to say. Okay, um, I can't comment or guess on that. It would be wrong of me. Um, what I can say is that there are some some companies out there who have better economy than others. And what we're likely to see, especially if this is a prolonged crisis, is that some of the weaker airlines um, who were struggling even before this obviously is going to struggle much more now. The more um, you are subjected to loans, for example, the more of your fleet that you have mortgaged um, and you have to pay interest rate on, the harder it's going to be because it means that even if you do stop the whole fleet from flying, the money is still going out, but there's no money coming in. And the airline industry is extremely money intensive. Like there's so much money moving in every single corner. Every, you know, every spare that you see cost five, six, 10, 15, 20,000 euro. Uh, a little nut can cost like 20 euro. Um, everything that you do that has anything to do with aircraft or aviation is expensive. So um, we are going to see some ramifications of this. And those ramifications will most likely be bankruptcies. Okay, there's going to be loads of pilots out on the market who weren't there before. But hopefully, like I said before, if the market stays more or less the same, as in people still want to fly, people still want to travel, that just means that there is a possibility for other airlines that have more sound finances to then grow into these roles. And I think that's what we will see. So will it be a hard year coming up? No question. It will be. Absolutely. Um, Will the airline industry go under? No. It will not. In uh, in a year from now, it will probably be where we were three months ago. And two years from now, it's probably going to be hopefully booming again. Okay, That's what I think anyway. But during this time, we are going to help, have to help each other out in order to, to, to get through it. You know, I don't know if I'm going to have a job. I have no idea. Um, I don't know if you are going to have a job, which means that we're all essentially in the same boat. Uh, wild... Wide World West. <laughs> Thanks again. As you can see, I'm still tripping over my tongue when I'm trying to uh, pronounce that name. Do failed check rides hurt your chance of getting hired? I have my first PPL check ride coming up in six to eight weeks, and I'm super pumped to give it a, get over that first hurdle. But slightly nervous. Uh, but I guess it's natural to be nervous. Yeah, it is natural to be nervous. And for your PPL, don't worry. No one, no one will ever check at your. Um, how you did on your PPL check, right? What will be important is when you start getting up towards your CPL, your instrument rating, your multi-engine rating and your ATPL exams, because those do matter. Um, If the airlines are looking to hire people, um, depending on how many people they need and how many people are applying, they can put different kind of obstacles in. And what they can say, for example, because it's up to them to decide, is that we will only take in people who have an average of 85% on their ATP exams and no fails. Right? They can do that. Um, even if you have passed everything, but you've failed a few, then they might not take you in for an interview because of that. 
Now, on the other side, if then they're looking for a lot of people and there's not a lot of people applying, well, then they might just scrap that and say, well, you got your licenses and everything. Yeah, well, come in for an interview and get your chance anyway. But at this point, just relax, do what you've been taught. You'll be doing great. Your school will not recommend you for a, for a check ride if they didn't believe that you will do great on it. So don't worry, all right? Just enjoy it and enjoy your PPL when you get it. Grand Rennie, thank you. Hello, Flight Shops. Is Flight Shops here as well? Oh man, I haven't seen Flight Shops. I have to go up in the comments here to make sure I'm not missing him. He's one of my favorite YouTubers. Uh, Flight Shops, there. Get T get T six Harvard time uh, to impress them on the resume. Yeah, yeah, and get go to go go to flight shops and ask if you can go out and get some T six Harvard because I have no idea where you're gonna get that time. But I know I would be impressed if I saw it on the CV. Not sure about the airlines though. Um, I hope you've checked out flight shops by the way because you know man, if you're looking at uh, like production quality. Um, I just feel ashamed about the stuff that I'm putting out. <laughs> so, um, cool. I'm getting a little bit behind here. There we go. That's Flight Shops. Um, Velislav, Velko. Hi, Mentor. There's a famous picture of a 707 doing a barrel roll during a demonstration flight. Is the 737 or any other plane you're familiar with capable of doing the same? Yeah. Absolutely. If you get a, you get me the hands of the 737 uh, and a little bit of training and it's not full of people, you can do that. Barrel roll um, doesn't require any G-forces. It means that the airframe doesn't get any damage from it. Um, the only thing you need really is speed and thrust, you know, power to do it. Um, if you've seen, I actually did a video where I rolled the 737 in, um, in a simulator. Now, that wasn't pretty. Um, I was not trained to do that. And I did it as part of an upset maneuver to show you that if you do find yourself in an upset upside down, you can actually continue to roll around. So you can check that out after this. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. A trained pilot like uh, he was who did that 737, sorry, 707 roll could easily do that. Well, easily. They could do that anyway. I'm sure, given um, flight shops a couple of hours in the 737, he would probably do it as well. Eric W, thank you. Uh, how would it work if shutdowns goes on longer? We hope not. Who checks the checker of the checking pilot that checks you on a check ride and so on? <laughs> That's a lot of checking, check, 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 check there. Uh, right, so this is the way it works. Um, as a top rating examiner, which I am, I can check any pilot um, under the influence of the aviation authority that I'm checking on behalf of, all right? So I could apply to check on behalf of almost any authority within EASA, within Europe, but at the moment I only do it on behalf of the um, of the Irish aviation authorities, okay? So I can do check rides, but every three years I need to renew my, my checking license, the fact, the fact that I am a checker, which I did just six months ago. And then there is something called a senior TRE, as in a TRE-S. That's a specific TRE that is very senior, that has been judged that he can or she can do these kind of checks. And they will come in and they will check me, not only on, you know, what the guys are doing, but how I am conducting as a type rating examiner, if I'm doing everything according to our um, operations training manual that we have to follow, part D, and and all of that, right? So he will be sitting in or she will be sitting in watching me, I'll be checking the guys, and then if everything's okay, I'll probably get some feedback about stuff I can improve, and then um, I'll get my license review renewed. Right, on top of that, I need the type rating instructor license, and that's the same thing. It's renewed every three years. They're not coinciding, so I'm doing them every like two years or something, where I need to do a training session, and then they can renew it based on that. Same thing there, there needs to be a TRE, a special TRE to do that. Um, when, it's, when it comes to this particular situation that we're in right now, um, we are going to find ourselves with a lot of pilots who should have done their recurrent training, but co couldn't. Right, because they couldn't get to the sim centers, so that means that a lot of pilots might might potentially run out of currency. Now that's not a problem, providing that it's done within a few months. Okay, so if a pilot runs out of currency, uh, they will come in. I will do a um, a renewal check instead of a revalidation, which is the same thing. It's just a different tick in the in the paperwork, really, um, and it's all good. As soon as they have the check done, they can fly. But if, but from the date that their license stopped until the date that they do the check, they cannot fly. 
right? They they have to they have to be on the ground. Now, under very specific circumstances, so like in the situation we are now with huge closures of countries and borders and airspaces, the uh, overlying governing authority, as in EASA in our case, they can go in and they can put emergency measures in force. That means that they can go out and they can stipulate emergency rules saying that because of the current calamity, we will grant the airlines an extension. So they can do, maybe they just need to do an LPC or they can extend the validity for four month of their OPC or something like that or they can do checks on on um, simulators that are not normally approved to do this in order to open up the availability of different simulators in different countries all of this have to be controlled and approved by the authorities on a case-to-case -case basis so it's not like it's going to be a blanket uh, approval but they will do that they will come in and they will try to help the airlines because they realize that you cannot sit in a situation like this and just say no you follow the rules you have to follow the rules, it doesn't work otherwise. You have to be flexible, otherwise the airlines, once everything, everyone is clear to fly, maybe they can't fly because they don't have pilots enough to fly their aircraft, which would be a tragedy. So you will see the EASA coming out with gui guidelines very soon. In fact, we're talking a little bit of that in a video that's coming up from the Airline Pilot Club. But uh, it's a great question, actually. Very good. So, Mikas Balkevecius, how real to land a Boeing without working engines? perfectly real right like I've, I've done a video on that as well uh, it's something that we not practice because it's not part of the curriculum to practice that but we do recognize that there's been instances like the Hudson River incident for example where we've had multiple bird strikes which has cancelled out the engines which means the pilots need to have some kind of, of what we call um, like catastrophe training okay they need to have at least felt it thought about what happens. So if they do find themselves in that situation, they will remember to start up the APU. They will know approximately the kind of gliding distance they have to deal with. They will recognize if, whether or not they can turn around or if they can go somewhere, um, somewhere else to land and how to think without panicking. Now guys, I did a video that I just released today about how to deal with crisis. It is completely tanking. No one is watching it for some reason. <laughs> uh, but I thought that it was a prudent thing to do because we, the airline pilots, have been taught throughout our career to deal with um, ongoing crisis in a particular way. That's why um, when all start, all hell breaks loose really in the flight deck and you start to have sirens and blinking lights and stuff not working, you still see the pilots being able to operate. And that is because we've been taught to do things in a very specific order. Um, that's what I did a video about today, because I thought that that kind of knowledge and that kind of structure on how to deal with um, incidents, accidents, um, crisis can be applied by you guys in your everyday life. You suddenly lose your job or your business is going under or your wife has left you or whatever. There is a way to sit down, slow things down, and structure it so that you can get the best out of the situation. Doesn't mean that you can always solve it, but you will get the best out of it, okay? Uh, and that's what my video that I just released on the channel um, just like three hours ago is about. Okay, so um, Gary Burke, I am starting an integrated course in AFTA in Cork, Ireland next month. What kind of state do you think the industry will be for the pilots in the next 18 months? Um, <laughs> that's like asking how long a string is. Okay, it's impossible to say because we don't know how long this is going to go on. My thinking is what I said earlier in the stream, which is I think in 18 months we will be back to some kind of normality. Okay, I think within the next 12 months, we're going to see a fairly, um, you know, a fair, a bit of a downturn. And definitely a downturn. There's going to be some really, really fluctuations in the pilot training market and the, in the uh, pilot hiring market. But in 18 months to two years, I think we're going to go, we'll be back to where we were again. And then I think it's going to take off from there. There has been a... Um, what should I say? There has been a perceived 
oncoming lack of pilots from about 2022. And I've mentioned this in live streams before. Um, that has to do with the baby boomers um, that was born in the 1950s, now finally going into retirement. They should have gone five years ago, but then they extended the mandatory retirement age from 60 to 65 for pilots, and they've been sticking around. Um, there's a lot of those pilots that, um, that will go into um, that will go into retirement, and there is a possibility now. And this is just me guessing but there is a little possibility that some of them might go early because of this if they see that they're suddenly faced with redundancies or that the airlines are now going to cut back on salaries and terms and conditions things like that there might be a few of them who say like all right listen i'm not i've seen this too many times in the industry i'm not going to go through it again they might go early then that might potentially alleviate this downturn a little bit when it comes to new hires. Like, like I said, once again, that's just a theory that I have. I have no backing for that theory, okay? But I think that that in any case, these guys, they will go by 22 to 25, um, which means that there will be a need for pilots, right? And as long as the market is still there, there's going to be someone flying those aircraft. There's going to be jobs to fly those aircraft. The orders to Boeing and Airbus are still there. Boeing and Airbus, uh, they have nine years full order books, you know. So there will be a light at the end of this tunnel. But the tunnel just appeared from nowhere. That's the problem here. It's like being out walking on a summer day. Everything is nice. And all of a sudden, you're in a black cave. And you can just see a dot of light in front of you. That's the kind of situation that we are finding ourselves in now. From all of a sudden you know and this is why this this is why i'm talking about crisis management because that's what it is if you have been have no warning whatsoever then people are not saving up money on their savings account in order to take you know six months of unpaid leave so there is some real sense of panic out there uh, which is where we want to come in where i want to come in and try to calm people down to, to, to the best of my abilities now when it comes to after um they're a great flight school all right so we will see you I'm, I'm guessing that you're in full contact with them about what's going on right now if not you should be um i know them well um and i know that they have a, a fantastic heart for their students they want to do what's best for their students all the time so um just reach out to them and see what's going on uh, right, so let's chase. There are a few airlines willing to, to fly uh, small pets in the cabin. Do you think it would be nice if more airlines allowed this? I am 55 and just got myself a Yorkshire Terrier puppy small dog. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's all down to the dog, really. There are some problems with taking animals into the cabin, and that has to do with people who are allergic, you know. The, the people with the allergy, they don't really want to be in a cabin that is potentially with dogs, and they haven't really... There's no tick in the box that you are allergic to dogs, and there's no way to get out of it if you find yourself sitting next to someone who has a dog with them. So there are some issues to this. Now, I personally have a dog as well, uh, and I know which airlines will allow me to take Pachi or Molly with us up to Sweden, and I know which airlines does not. So I don't... I can see both pros and cons with it, and I don't really want to get into that uh, that discussion about um, you know whether it's a good idea or not. Nick W, great work. Well, thank you, Nick W. You're really, really helping out as well. Um, so, Bishop five one eight zero seven. Have you ever had an aborted takeoff or a mayday incident? Uh, yes, I've had both. I've had a very low speed aborted takeoff uh, for a failure. You know, if you've seen my rejected takeoff video, which I did years ago, uh, you know that prior to 18 knots, we reject for basically any kind of warning. So I was taking off out of uh, Charlois, and uh, we had a warning coming up at about uh, like 10 knots, you know, just starting to roll. And in that case, I didn't do a full rejected takeoff, I just took the thrust off, and we just taxi on I had and taxi off the runway so it wasn't I mean, it wasn't a big thing I don't think that the passengers even realized it to be honest um, the um, mayday I've had I've had medical maydays uh, I've had um, a combination of medical maydays and um, and a bird strike actually I had a medical murder mayday and then we had to come in on approach and then we had a, a bird strike a big eagle that flew in and bent our leading edge devices on the right hand wing so we got that as well um, I've had some flap incidents as well where the flaps uh, were skewed when they came up so you can only use flap 15 for landing but they're small things you know the things that are easily handleable providing that you follow like we said the crisis management uh, structure that we have and the uh, QRH the uh, good old quick reference handbook that we have still to work with on the 737 believe it or not 
Cool. Uh, so, S Jim Simmons, thanks for all you're doing for aviation. Well, I'm trying to give back from a world that has given me so much. You know, um, I would have loved to have someone um, approachable, someone who really cared when I was in training. Um, there was no real internet forums that you can go to without being being completely humiliated back then uh, if you didn't know what you were talking about. I strongly disagree with that. I think that everyone has been a newbie at some point in time. The day that you forget how it feels to be new at something, you shouldn't really, definitely you shouldn't be a trainer, uh, but you should definitely not have to do with anything that has to do with people, really, because everyone, everyone screws up sometimes and everyone doesn't know what they're doing. If someone would put me into a new job now, even if it's a job that I know, so even if I would be getting a 737 job in a different airline, I would be new. I would not know their standard operating procedures. I would use a lot of my uh, of my capacity to try to remember that, which would make me a worse airline captain. And I know this, you know, and I know that you guys are feeling that. So that's why, like all of the things that I've been doing, the YouTube channel started because of that. If you go back and you roll back to my very, very first videos, you will see that it was just a dude, a floating head sitting, no editing, nothing in front of a computer talking about aviation because I felt that someone should be doing it, someone should be explaining it and in a positive and constructive way. And then I created the, uh, the Mentor Aviation app. Now, obviously, um, uh, this is the old version of the app, but, but that was also done because of that. You know, I, I decided to try 360 cameras because after 9-11, no one had access to the cockpit. And I felt that if you want to become a pilot, you should probably at least have had a chance to come in and see what it is that we're doing. So that led to the, the first app that I did, which was Mentor 360, which is just a video player um, that shows me in 360 doing some of these things. And then it brought me over to the, um, to the Mentor Aviation app, okay? So the Mentor Aviation app has all of these 360 videos and these training collections. Those are for sale, by the way, because I need to get some money in from that app in some way. But the whole app in itself is completely free. And it is free because I wanted to create a forum which did just that, which where people could come. If you are 13 years old and wanted to know about aviation, you can come and you can ask a question to me, which is 18 years base TRE, um, senior line training captain. And I will be able to tell you that, yeah, this is how you should be thinking. You're on a great path, you have a great target, keep working like you do. That's what we do in the app, and that's why I am so careful with it. That's why I take care of it like it is my own little kid, because I want to make sure that anyone who comes in there get that feeling. People who are misbehaving inside of my app get kicked out. They get a warning, and then they get kicked out. And I can do that because it's my app. I don't have to, you know, go via Facebook or go via Twitter or something like that. I can have my own walled garden where anyone can feel safe and free and talk about technical stuff in the forums, talk about whatever they feel like. Right now, a lot of people are afraid they can be in the normal chat and talk about that. And this is the kind of things I'm doing. That's why, you know, when Andy O'Shea... Um, you know, reached out to me with the idea of the Airline Pilot Club. I jumped at it because I think that it's a great idea in order to increase, you know, the quality for you. If you go back, once again, now I'm, I'm rambling on here, but once again, if you go back to the beginning of my videos, when I talk about what's important before you start your training, you will find that from the very first video, I have told people that you need to make sure that you have what it takes before you start paying any money for training. You need to have done a suitability test, is what I called it. And this is why the Airline Pilot Club will be giving that to people. We will give not only the test so that you can check whether or not you're ready, but also feedback as in how can you improve in order to get ready. Hugely important, because today people do these kind of tests and then they get a no, and they never know why. They don't know why an airline chose not to t hire them. They don't know why a flight school said just no to them, even though that's happening far too rarely. So that's one of the things that we are trying to do. Um, so thank you. That's the longest, longest answer to a non-question that I've ever given. When will you fly paramotor? Um, I actually looked into flying paramotor. I was really into it for a while. I was watching YouTube videos all the time about doing paragliding and stuff. I thought it looked so cool. And then I looked into the danger, sorry, the the, uh, the accident statistic to it, and was horrified to see how dangerous it was. It's like twice, 
like worse than driving uh, sports motorcycles. And I thought, nah, father of two, provider of the family, flying for work. Even though I think that I could probably use my experience to make sure that I don't get into those situations, I'm also acutely aware that I would be, once again, a newbie. Uh, so I thought, nah, I'll wait with that. Joseph Charles, thank you. In your view, how might this recent COVID-19 crisis affect the 77 Max groundings and type rating difficulties? Lots of love from the States. Uh, Joseph, I said this in my last... Um, in my last live stream, and I'm, I'm going to say it again, um, I have taken a decision, a conscious decision, not to go into the 737 MAX controversy um, anymore. I did that for a few videos, um, and I realized now um, that I am going to be flying these aircraft, right? I'm going to be a type rating instructor and an examiner on these aircraft. So it's not prudent or advisable for me to sit and judge on these kind of things on YouTube and then go and do a type rating for cadets that have seen those videos with me, okay? I, 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 it, it just didn't feel right. Um, so I'm gonna try to keep away from that controversy. What I can say though, is that obviously it has taken the max out of the news, which is good to give Boeing a breather for their, their uh, recertification flights. I hope that the aircraft is back again. And obviously it's also taken a little pressure off the, the, um, the companies that you know, just three months ago really needed these aircraft, all of a sudden they now have all of their fleet, some of them at least, sitting on the ground, which takes a little bit of pressure off them as well. So from, from that perspective, I think that it's probably, um, I wouldn't say good, but it, I'd say that it's taken a little bit of pro uh, pressure off the process, which should hopefully get it back quicker. That's what I'm hoping anyway. So how long is a piece of string? It's about yay long. That's a good question. Um, John, uh, Seven Oaks, your aircraft has been de-iced, can it ice taxiing? Uh, when your, I guess that's when your aircraft has been de-iced, can it ice taxiing? Um, I mean, yeah, we can taxi, we can taxi out with an aircraft that hasn't been de-iced, we can then de-ice the aircraft and we can continue taxi. The aircraft that is de-iced will not, that will not have an effect on the actual taxiing, because if you're taxiing on ice, that is still ice, so we'll still be slippering around with the aircraft. So we have to be very careful when you're taxiing on very slippery surface, if that's the question. And if that's not the question, I'm not sure what the question is. So um, uh, rephrase it if you if you need to. I hope that answered it. Sam Petros, just giving you a thumbs up. Well, thank you very much, Sam, and thank you for your awesome work in the app. Uh, Julian, Francois Collin, I wear glasses, I'm short-sighted. Can I become a pilot? Well, I certainly hope so, because I wear glasses. Uh, you never see them on my uh, videos because these are my Clark Kent glasses. They enable me to walk around in public and do simulator tests and stuff without people recognizing me. Uh, but yeah, you can within certain limits. I should say that you have to go in for your first, for your like first class one. There are certain uh, eyesight restrictions that you will have to follow. You will find them if you go in and check in your um, uh, aviation authorities home page they will have that or, or if you just contact a aeromedical center or an aeromedical examiner they will be able to give you exactly what kind of limits there are okay but check out my video that i did on on um, pilots uh, medicals as well because there's some quite interesting stuff about uh, like laser surgery and how careful you have to be with laser surgery in those videos so check that out um so, Scott P, thanks for your videos. I plan to get an ultralight license and then I hope to move to a PPL and eventually commercial. Thank and God bless you, Peter. Well, that sounds like a great plan, all right? You're doing it the modular way, uh, which is probably smart at this point um, to slow down a little bit, maybe avoid the, the, the downturn that is about to happen and, um, and maybe save some money as well. Hopefully you can work while you're doing it so you keep your your uh, depths to an absolute minimum, which is, which is good. So I wish you the best of luck with that and thank you for following the channel. So, uh, Leon van Gressen have maybe the most common question of them all, which is, is there an max age to become a civil airline pilot? And the answer to that is 65. So above 65, you cannot become a commercial pilot anymore. Anytime up to that, you can become. Now, obviously, above 50, it's starting to become hard to kind of make the money back from the investment that it would cost you to, uh, to become a commercial pilot. Uh, but I have, and I've said this before, I have met pilots. The oldest one I've met was, was a train driver that was driving trains up to 
is the age of 50. And at 50 years old, he decided it would be kind of neat to not drive planes, but to fly aircraft instead. So, said and done, he did his training, he got a job as a first officer, and when I, uh, when I met him, he was 53 or 54 and on his way for a command. So, kudos, you know, that happens. Now, does that work everywhere? No, probably not. You might, you will probably never come across an airline that says that they don't take pilots of a certain age. But it is worth checking around a little bit if they do have any preferences. That kind of unspoken preferences, things like that. Uh, I know my airlines does not. They look at what kind of quality you have. Are you a good pilot? If the answer to that is yes, sure, here's what we can offer you. Um, but that might be the, not be the case everywhere. Right, so uh, while <laughs> White World West is just giving me practice to say his name, and obviously I need more practice on that. Good, so that's all the Super Chat questions for now. Actually, we have one that I didn't see here. I'm just going to slide up here. As always, thanks for a fabulous video from Carl Simmons. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here, being awesome, and listening to me <sighs> speaking for hours and hours on end. As you're seeing, I will be doing more live stream videos. Obviously, you guys seem to like it, and uh, I am just sitting here at home anyway. So if I can do more live streams and you guys want me to, I'll be trying to do more of that. But I already do that inside of the Metro Aviation app, okay? Now, the only caveat there is in order to ask questions, you need to be a premium member, which you can be in two ways. Either you can pay $5 per month to be a premium member, or you can be a uh, patron at a $10 level or up. If you are, then I will give you premium membership inside of the app anyway, which means that you can ask questions during my slightly more private, smaller live streams there. And um, you just have to send me a message in Patreon so that I know that it's from me within Patreon and I need your nickname in the app. Okay, that's the name that the other people see in the chat. Okay, it's not your name, it's your nickname. And when you send that to me at the $10 or above level in Patreon, then I will give you the premium for free. So, Sep, uh, from the normal chat here, I'll try to give some of that as well. Sep for IK, what's the difference between heading and course? Okay, heading and course are the same in zero wind. So if you don't have any wind, you point your nose and the aircraft will go there. Now, the heading is where your nose is pointing. The track is where the aircraft is actually going. So if you have a lot of wind coming from this direction, well, in order for you to keep a track straight ahead, you're going to have to put the heading up against the wind. So think about a boat that's trying to cross a river that's flowing. If they want to do a straight crossing, you're going to have to put a little bit of, um, of a correction angle up against that stream in order to reach the um, you know that point on the other side of the river. It's exactly the same with aircraft. So in that case, when you have wind, you'll have one heading and one track. Obviously, the track is still where the aircraft is going. So, how old do you need to be uh, to get a pilot license from Just Fun? Um, that differs a little bit depending where you are. Uh, in order to get hired as a commercial pilot, you need to be 18 years old. I think that you can actually lift a CPL in some parts of the world, sort of PPL in some parts of the world when you're 16 years old. Uh, but um, and you can definitely get a glider's license when you're 15 years old. So, what is the most common thing that passengers steal from airplanes? I would like to take loo rolls for the toilets. Yeah, of course. Right now, they just steal toilet paper because... I don't know. Like, I, I really don't know. I have a theory, actually. I, I'd love to hear what you think about my theory when it comes to the excessive buying of toilet paper. I think that when people think, when it pops up in their head that I'm going to be locked in my house, for two weeks. Okay. The first thing they're thinking about is not how do I get rice and pasta and food for my kids. The first thing they think, what if I roll, what if I go out of toilet paper? <gasps> oh no. And the thing that people are most afraid of is losing their dignity and losing their sense of civilization. And I think the feeling of not having toilet paper, of maybe having to use a towel or God forbid go into the shower and do it there, is just something that people just feel bad about. So as soon as they feel, I'm going to have to be locked in for two more weeks, the first thing they think of is toilet paper. And that's why people are running like crazy for the toilet paper aisle and buying, you know, a year's worth of toilet paper at once. Um, I think that has something to do with it. They're definitely something that pops up straight in their head when they think about being locked in somewhere. 
Now, I should say to everyone that's watching this, and it's almost a thousand people that's watching this right now, that we are in the lockdown, okay? for almost a week now, but the state has gone out and they said, we are going to guarantee that you have food in the, um, on, in the uh, supermarket, that you can buy fuel, that you can heat your house, that you can get medication from your pharmacy, that you can walk your dog, that you can take care of your old, all of the essential bits that you can get to a hospital. All of that is guaranteed, but we limit it down to one person in the family. So one person in the family can go to the supermarket and buy what you need and then come home again. So. Even if you do get into a situation where you do get into lockdown, you will be able to get food and precious toilet paper. So to answer your question after that little rant, <laughs> and there was a while back in, I think around 2006, somewhere around there, where there was a huge trend in the gay community to use airplane seat belts as, um, as belts. Okay, there was a fashion trend. Someone said it. Probably some famous person had it. Um, so that meant that in two <laughs> that year, there was an enormous amount of stolen seat belts. Now that comes with a huge problem. If a seat belt is stolen, it means that that seat cannot be used. Okay, so that became a huge issue. Um, we even had, I remember specifically a flight into Niederrhein where uh, the cabin crew had noticed, they had kind of found some suspicious behavior because you do need to fiddle quite a bit in order to get the seatbelt uh, seat belt off. And they had noticed something and they knew which it was. And they went there when the aircraft had deboarded, they checked, they saw the seatbelt was missing. So they ran out, the cabin crew ran out, called the police that was on there and said like, listen, we need to find that person. They have stolen the seatbelt and the police just doink and took them, found the seatbelt and they got fined uh, a lot of money. Okay, because you're fiddling with safety equipment, which is just not okay, right? It's not okay. Um, but that's the only trend of stealing things in the airplanes that I can remember. You know, I, I guess there's always people who's going to try to steal the, the life vests or whatever. But once again, that's also fit. That's also tampering with emergency equipment and can get you into some serious problems. As in, I think in some countries you can fail jail time for that. So do not do it. Okay, you can find it on eBay uh, or somewhere where they find that they build those fake versions of the same. Cool. Uh, right. So let's see. I think there was some more super chat questions here, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to miss any of those. Uh, see, my administrators are doing a great job. Thank you very much for those of you who are helping me as well with the, with uh, taking care of the chat. Um, there are some people spamming, spamming, and that's not okay. Steal the yolk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Mentor pilot, how does the double propeller turboprop, one propeller right behind the, the other spinning in different direction work? And what benefit does it have compared to other methods? All right, so these are the super fans um, that we've seen some versions of. I think the Russians had a version of this as well. The um, Basically, they work like huge uh, turbofan fan engines, but because of you know the, the the size of the propellers they cannot be inside of a um, um, you know they cannot be enclosed like our fans are um, benefits are that they become much they become really really effective uh, they drive a huge amount of of air um, I think there was some noise issues with them uh, given that they will probably be at supersonic speeds the tips of those things but. I'm gonna be honest and say that I'm that's not my area of expertise. I'm sure that someone else, uh, maybe plane savers, you can ask Mikey and see what he says. Good. I'm gonna go back here to see that. Uh, let's see. There is another super chat here. Um, so, Dar sign. Hi, Petter. Loved your video on crisis management. What would you suggest for a pilot in their near future? Jet or turboprop type rating, or go on to becoming a CFI? What is a good career starter versus CPL, ME, IR? Well, you need CPL, probably MI, ME and IR in order to become a CFI in most cases. I would probably, instead of taking a type rating, especially now, I would go for CFI. There's been a huge, uh, especially in the Europe, in, in under IASA, there's been a lack of qualified and good um, CFIs. So that's be, always been a good way to, to gather both money, but also save some, sorry, both 
time, but also save some money and even make some money. There's like some really, really good, decent salaries for CFIs in the good in the big flight schools. So I would probably go for that because it would enable me to kind of water and live through a, a downturn in the industry. But that's just me, and that's just without researching much. Now, type ratings, buying type ratings is something that I've always told people to be very careful with, right? It's very, very hard to be able to buy a type rating that you can actually use. And you, the worst case scenario, you'll end up in the stupid situation of having to buy a type rating twice. And that's because some airlines will only allow you to fly as a cadet if you go through their type rating, as in the insurance companies, have said so the governing authorities have said that the only way that you can fly with a 250 hour cadet in the 737 is that you have controlled the entire type rating so that means that if you have 250 hours and you've bought a type rating and then you apply to some of these airlines that take low hour cadets they might say well that's great you can't use that type rating you have to buy hours and there you are having to redo an entire type rating and pay for it again so be very careful with buying type ratings unless there is a job at the end of it unless there's an airline that has in writing told you that if you get your type rating here, we will then hire you on that type and fly with you. That can be on smaller type ratings, um, turboprops, uh, some smaller jets, um, like corporate jets, for example. Unless you have that, I wouldn't do it. All right, that, that's just me and my personal opinion. And Marcus Langendorf, you have the late last super chat questions here. I just have to find it in the normal chat because for whatever reason I can't see it at the bottom here. Still don't know why that happens here on YouTube. Um, but I will find your super chat question here. I just have to scroll up a bit. There we go. I think the, the previous guy meant after the icing, can an aircraft build up ice again during taxi? Oh. In that, if that's the case, yes, um, but we have something called holdover time. That means that once we have de-iced, the, the manufacturers of the de-icing fluid would guarantee a certain amount of time that the wings will stay ice-free. That depends on the outside temperature, the temperature in the wing tanks, the kind of precipitation we have. So, for example, with uh, freezing rain, it will have a much slower holdover time, and with light snow, it might have a really long holdover time. But at least once we apply the second layer of fluid, it would start counting that hold over time and if we're taxing out and we end up in a queue and that hold over time exceeds or a different type of precipitation comes that we didn't count on well then we can expect there's going to be ice on the wings now and we just have to turn back in the ice again so great question once again and guys I think that it I see um, I think I see flight shops is still hanging around in that case you must have some record like two hours watching uh, <laughs> watching live streams here because I saw you on on the plane savers and Captain Joe live stream as well um, maybe next time we could do something like this together if you're watching this um, Steve we could uh, we could do a live stream kind of the style like uh, plane servers like uh, Mikey and Joe did um, I think it would be uh, it would be really cool to be many of us like maybe four of us youtubers doing it together that would be a hoot <laughs> Uh, so, Marcus Langendorf, I'm not allowed to ask my questions in Super Shows because of regional limitations. That's for Thomas Fjell. Okay, Thomas, I'll give you the chance now to ask your question then in the normal chat and I'll uh, answer it as soon as long as I can see it. Uh, Jakob Stolesen, uh, should I pause my pilot study and do another one now in the pandemic? Uh, that's a pop, that's depending on where you are. Uh, and let's see, I just want to make sure that I'm not missing too much question here um you have to talk to your school all right it's important that you have a good communication going with them and see how far have you got until you're done with your training um how is the school reacting how's the school's economy that's also very important guys make sure that your school's economy can take this uh, so i can't really give you a straight answer to that so let's see, there's too much Fjeld that we're looking for. There we go. Um, man, there's so many questions here. I keep using Mentor Pilot. Tjena granne. <laughs> looking ahead beyond the pandemic, when we're returning to normal, I'd love to somehow start a regional charter airline. Any thoughts and ideas? So many questions. Well, too much. Um, there is a famous saying that the quickest way to become a millionaire is to be a billionaire and start an airline. All right. 
it is very precious few people who have ever been able to start an airline and make money on it, right? It's very, very hard for the reasons that I've been talking about before. And even if you do start a really profitable, great airline that makes loads of money, you still end up in these situations because it's famously like the airline industry is always the first ones to get hit when there's a pandemic a war, an economic downturn, or someone forgets to flush the toilet. Like it's really, really, really hard to, to start an airline. But if you do, well, what you need to do is you need to have an operations manual. You need to have an air operator, operator certificate. So you need to talk to someone who's good at doing these things. There are people who are really, really talented in setting up airlines from scratch. You need to have a good market strategy and you need to have find someone to finance your aircraft. So you have a lot of work in front of you, but I wish you the best of luck. And please, please call it Mentor Airlines. And I have, in that case, I have a library that you can use. <laughs> All right, guys, I've been doing this for close to an hour 15 now, so I'm starting to run out of voice here. Um, I will be doing more live streams like this, and then there will be loads of material coming out on the Mentor Pilot channel as well. Now, you can really help me by a few ways, guys. A, you can become a Patreon, all right? That means that you will be previewing my videos, you'll be have a chance to kind of fail safe to make sure that I don't say something stupid, but it will also be providing the channel with the financial means in order for me to continue to focus on this and not being out looking for instructor jobs instead, all right? That's one thing. If you become a Patreon, I am hugely grateful for the help. And like I said, at the $10 level or up, you'll also get a premium membership in the app. You can also, if you have the app, you can go in and you can give a review of the app, hopefully a positive one, because that will increase the uh, visibility of the app to everyone in the app stores, all right? And even if there's people who have done that before, you might not have done it in your country, all right? Because I need it in every single country if it's possible. And last, Share my videos, guys. If you find someone now who needs uh, crisis management to think that that would be a great idea, you know, that someone is really, really worried now and they think you think that they might be benefiting from watching the crisis video, send it on. Share it on Facebook, on Twitter, whatever. Because the more visibility... I see, <laughs> I can see the channel average is like dropping. It's dropped 35% since the start of this pandemic. Um, people are just too focused on the news right now. They just want to look at uh, what's happening in their country. And I understand that, obviously. But this could be a useful distraction. And it could actually help some people. So that's it, guys. Without further ado, have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Stay in-house if you're told to do so and we will get through this guys we will and there will be a very bright light at the other side of the tunnel so see you.